See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily, and you have been filled in him, who is the head of all rule and authority. In him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God, who raised him from the dead. And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. So I, uh, I read this week about a, a guy by the name of Danny. He was at work. And he was heads down, working hard, when his phone began to blow up. He ignored it at first, but finally he answered it. It was his wife clearly wanting his attention. And so he answered the phone, and after a couple of seconds of chit-chat, she asked him, um, Danny, do you ever get this sudden pain in your chest, like someone has a voodoo doll of you, who they're, they're just kind of poking over and over and over and over again in your chest? And, of course, Danny's alarmed. He goes, no, baby, never. What's, what's going on? Are you all right? And she was silent for a second, and then she said, well, well how about now? Anything? <laughs> yeah, <so. laughs> <You know. laughs> Glad you were awake enough to appreciate it. That's good. Um, you know, the idea of, of voodoo and, and our modern world it is the punchline of some really good jokes. Um, it's some really funny memes. Uh, and we don't take it really too serious, but I do remember several years ago having a conversation with Dr. Richard Pratt. Many of us know Dr. Pratt. He was a longtime professor over in Orlando at Reform Theological. He's the, the founder of Third Millennium Ministries. He's spoken here a couple of times. Wonderful man. And in that conversation, he told me, he said, you know, back when I was at seminary, if I had all power, I would have required the, the, the seminary students, the men who were going to be pastors or missionaries, to do a six-month practicum in Haiti so that they could see that voodoo is not a joke, that there, it's very real, that there are spiritual forces at play and powers behind it, and it's, it's dangerous, Cultic practices like voodoo, they may be dangerous, but even more dangerous are those who take biblical truth and they combine it with spiritual error, creating a mishmash of a belief system that ends up shipwrecking and confusing those who are not firm in their faith. And this was the danger that was before the Colossian church. This is why Paul writes the book of Colossians. They had at least one person, if not more, false teachers who were threatening them in this way, and he was concerned that they were going to fall for it. Here in chapter 2, beginning really last week, but especially these, this, these verses on to the end of the chapter, Paul directly confronts this false belief system, and we're going to unpack it over the next three weeks. This morning, we're going to focus only on verses 8 to 10 where Paul starts with a very strong warning that's wrapped with true, genuine concern. He tells to uh, Colossian Christians, beware of spiritual pirates. Now you say, pirates. Hmm. Now, if you are tempted to think that I chose the words pirates because the very first, one of the first books I read in first grade was Treasure Island by Robert Louis Stevenson, or that I have watched virtually every Errol Flynn movie about pirates. I've even watched the bad Pirates in the Caribbean movies, not just the good ones. If you think that I maybe for a minute was tempted to dress up like Jack Sparrow this morning to make the sermon memorable, 
You would, you would be right, but that's not why I chose the word. Okay? Remember last week, I told you that in this passage, Paul utilizes word picture after word picture after word picture. And we had a lot of them last week, four or five of them in the previous verses. Well, there's a word picture here. See to it that no one takes you captive. Literally, Paul says, be on guard. Beware. Take steps to protect yourself to ensure that you are not carried off as spiritual booty. Booty. Now, some of you teenagers are laughing because you're thinking in booty in a different way, but that's an older word for pirate treasure. And the minute I saw booty, I immediately saw Jack Sparrow. <laughs> and, there's, and it's a real word. It's a, I could have used a different picture. I could have used the picture of a slaver, someone who takes people into slavery. But because I like pirates, I chose pirates. It's the same concept. Beware of spiritual pirates. They are much more dangerous than their physical counterparts. Physical, literal pirates, as we have plenty of them in our world today, they can certainly threaten what is temporal, what is physical, but spiritual pirates threaten what is eternal. And Paul was very familiar with them. In fact, What's interesting about him writing this is who is with him at this point in time. You know, he's in Rome. He's in house arrest. He's got a, a group of guys with him who are doing ministry with him. There's Luke and there's Epaphras and there's, uh, uh, you know, there's a guy by the name of Demas. Years from now, after he writes this letter, he will be in Rome again, in prison again. And this time he is facing the executioner's axe. And he writes this, Timothy, please come as soon as you can. Demas has deserted me because he loves the things of this life and has fled to Thessalonica. So at the end of Colossians, you're going to see in chapter 4 where Demas is mentioned as a valuable val uh, um, fellow laborer and assistant to the, the Apostle Paul. But just a few years afterwards, he's fallen prey to spiritual pirates. The tactics of spiritual pirates haven't changed much since the time of Paul. He goes on to say, See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit. Now, the word philosophy here isn't saying that as Christians we ought to be ignorant rubes. The word philosophy here isn't, just, isn't referring to like Socrates and Plato and Aristotle and those who, who have a true desire for understanding so that they can answer the big questions in life. That's our narrow definition of philosophy. In Paul's day, the, the definition of philosophy was much larger. It, it would include Socrates and Plato, but it also included all kinds of groups. Any kind of group that had a belief system that was <clears throat> dealing with spiritual matters or eternal matters or the meaning of life or how to live your life, and it didn't matter who they were, how valid it was or wasn't. It included false religious systems, cultic practices, groups that engaged in pagan rituals who believed in magical you know, potions and <clears throat> spells and, and that kind of thing. In this passage, he has some, a, a, a particular idea in mind, and you get this in later verses. They give us more context. That word philosophy, just basically think of it like a false religious system. There was a false, there was somebody that no one, there was a person that he had in mind to take you captive by a false religious system. And this false religious system was a blend of uh, Christianity and Judaism and pagan thought and mystical practices. He goes on to describe it as being empty deceit. To the, to the Ephesian church, Paul ha gives a similar warning uh, he says to them, let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. These false religions were, um, they were just shallow nonsense with empty words that were long on promise but short on delivery, being delivered by fast talkers. 
That's the idea here. He's saying, don't be taken captive. Don't be led off into spiritual slavery. Don't be captured as spiritual booty by a fast talker who's spinning a false religion to you that's nothing more than a mishmash of a little bit of Christianity and a little bit of worldly philosophy and a little bit of mystical practices. That's the warning here. Beware of spiritual pirates. And the warning needs to be given because the message that spiritual pirates proclaim is it's extremely tempting to the average person. The second half of the verse says, See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world. Those last two phrases describe why these false teachings are so alluring. Human tradition, that refers to uh, knowledge and maybe insider knowledge and special rituals that are passed down from generation to generation with the idea being that these traditions are like rungs in a ladder that you climb in order to ultimately get access to God. Elemental spirits, that phrase refers to the the belief that there are spiritual powers attached to our physical world, that there are spiritual powers behind material objects in some way, and that if you learn through that, maybe through those human traditions, how to manipulate your physical world, you gain access to that spiritual power in the eternal realm so that you can get what you want right now in this world. Get the life that you want to have here by manipulating objects in order to get that spiritual blessing. So, for example, several years ago, I was on a missions trip to India, and I walked into a home, and it was a very small home, but in the the living room, and one end of the living room was a massive shrine to their god, one of their gods, this family's god of choice of the many gods that are worshipped in hinduism and there were candles and it was elaborately decorated and there was food out at the shrine and there was wine out at the shrine and this family every morning started their day as a family bowing before this shrine at night bowing before the shrine and worshiping why because they wanted to access the spiritual power behind that shrine to give them the life that they wanted now as people who lived in India. These two phrases, human tradition and and, uh, the elemental spirits, they're different sides of the same powerful temptation. Apart from the gospel of Jesus Christ, every major world religion, every wacko cult group out there, and, by the way, every perversion or error within streams of the Christian church, they all have something in common. There's a basic principle at their core, and that is this. And it's, it is, it's incredibly tempting to our fallen sinful nature. And they all have it. And essentially it says, you can have God's blessing in this life. You can have security about the next life if you do fill in the blank. And every religion, every wacko cult, every perversion of Christianity that you will see on TV or in the media, they all have a blank or several blanks. If you do A, B, C, X, Y, Z, then you will get the life that you want to have. Then you will be in control and have what you desire. If you work hard enough, if you don't behave in this way, if you do behave this way. If you wash Buddha with special water and light incense before him and bow multiple times, three times a day, if you make a pilgrimage to Mecca, if you eat kosher and no pork and other things that are awfully delicious. (laughs) 
And Christianity is not immune from this. And, and versions of Christianity. If you go to the altar and light candles and pray for your ancestor, then they can leave torment earlier and get to heaven faster. If, parents, you raise your children and educate them exactly like this, then they will turn out wonderful. And by the way, if you don't, well, you're going to have a hellion on your hands. If you submit to your husband in a particular way, you're a good wife, and God will bless you. If you don't sing these kinds and styles of songs in your church, God will be more pleased with your worship and bless you. If you put this, if you have enough faith, I should have said, if you have enough faith and you put this little cloth on your diseased kidney, then God will heal you. If you give money to our project and this effort that our group is doing, then God will bless you and you will become rich and healthy and wealthy and wise. If you name it and claim it, you got it, as long as it's in faith. I mean, this is everywhere in our society today, and we hear it from other religions, from wacko cults, from perversions of Christianity. If you meditate and get quiet and begin to pray and empty your mind and then say these syllables over and over and over again, you will be filled with the Holy Spirit. You will speak in tongues and you'll have an unlimited source of power to live the Christian life. If you do fill in the blank. And it's a powerful temptation. It's a temptation that Adam and Eve fell for in the Garden of Eden. I mean, think about that. Satan comes to our original parents, and he says to them, if you eat of that fruit, you won't die. You'll actually get the life that you want. You'll get what you want. You'll be just like God. You'll be powerful. You'll be in control of your own life and your own destiny. Church, spiritual pirates simply in our day, simply repackage Satan's lie in the garden for our context and our world. You can be in control of your life and your destiny. You can be like God. You don't have to take everything that Jesus says. Just take the parts that resonate with you, that are true for you, because you need to have a truth that fits who you are that you can live with, and don't worry, God's not going to reject you. Why would he reject what you believe? Because you're being true to yourself. Nothing's more important than you being true to yourself. Do you realize how stupid that is? As fallen creatures, we struggle with sin every day. So let's be true to ourselves. Let's be true to our sinful selves. I mean, that's just the stupidest thing you ever Ever, I mean, but we buy it, we, we, we swallow it, hook, line, and sinker. You pick your truth. Jesus just isn't quite enough, so fill in the blank. Paul's warning is real. It's as relevant to us today as it was to the Colossians. Beware of spiritual pirates. And in the same way, this morning, his encouragement at the end of verse 8 is also just as relevant. He says, see to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit. According to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. Did you catch that? I mean, here's what Paul is saying. He warns us about spiritual pirates, about being taken captive by anything other than Jesus, because it leads to destruction and condemnation and death. Don't be taken captive by all of this thing. Don't be taken captive by anything other than Christ. Did you catch that? So as much as he warns us about the spiritual pirates, he encourages us to be captivated by Christ instead. Eternal life and all 
spiritual blessings belong to those who are captivated by Jesus, who are trusting in him for what he has done for us and not for what we do for ourselves. This morning, let me ask you an important question. In what do you trust to have a relationship with God? Are you trusting in what you do in order to relate to God? Or are you trusting in what Jesus has done for you on his cross and in his resurrection? Is Jesus your Savior and Lord? Are you trusting in Jesus alone? Or are you trusting in a little bit of Jesus and a whole lot of what you do? If it's the latter, you've been taken captive by false religion. The good news of Jesus Christ is this. We cannot save ourselves. So the good news actually starts with bad news. The bad news that we are all sinners. We cannot save ourselves. We can never do enough to gain God's pleasure. We can never do enough for him to say, you know what? Doggone it. Andrew, you're awesome. Come on in. Like it's the price is right or something. Come on down. You've done it. You come to heaven. Not you. Sorry, Rob. <laughs> Haven't quite made it there yet, buddy. The good news of the gospel starts with bad news, in a sense. None of us can do it, be good enough. None of us can earn it. None of us can do the good news. Jesus has done it for us. Are you captivated by Jesus? Are you captivated by him? Is he your Lord and Savior? Does he have your heart? The last couple of verses answer an important question, especially maybe for those of you who don't yet know Christ. You might be thinking to yourself, well, well, why be captivated by Jesus? In verses 9 and 10, Paul gives us that answer. I'm going to summarize it with this morning's takeaway truth. Our, our, it it kind of gives us a little answer to this question of why be captivated in a simple answer. And as you look at these verses, you can realize that all that is deepest in God is summed up in Christ. This would, this would be why Paul would say in verses 9, why should you be captivated in Christ? Because all that God is is summed up in Jesus. And then in these verses, he kind of unpacks this with three reasons. Beginning in verse 9, for in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. You should be captivated by Jesus because he is fully God and fully human. Jesus is God in the fullest sense of the word. All of God is Jesus. There's nothing about God, no attribute, no characteristic, no blessing, no power that is not found fully in Jesus and available through him. The emphasis of this verse is that as God in the flesh, only in Jesus can we know and see God. No one other than Jesus can do this for us. To see Jesus is to see God. You want to see God? Be captivated by Jesus. You want to know God? Be captivated by Jesus. By Jesus. Want to have God's power and presence in your life? Be captivated by Jesus. And so the conclusion here is, is obvious. Since Jesus is the only embodied deity, it is absolutely foolish to look to someone else or to somewhere else for our salvation and for our transformation. Only Jesus as the perfect man, could stand on the cross in humanity's place and pay the penalty of our sin. And only Jesus, at the same time as the perfect God, could satisfy God's wrath towards our sins and provide us with forgiveness and eternal life. Only Jesus can do this because he's fully God, fully human at the same time. When Jesus rose from the dead, 
It means, and he ascended into heaven, it means that right now, sitting at the right hand of the Father is a perfect human being who at the same time is perfectly God. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, and the Word took on flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory of Jesus, the one who was full of grace and truth. We're captivated with him because he's fully God, fully human. That mystery alone right there will occupy us for the rest of our lives, trying to unpack it and apply it and figure it out. But there's a second reason, verse 10, and you have been filled in him. We should be captivated because Jesus fills us and he completes all who are united to him through faith. Now, I have to confess that Paxson, Stole my thunder a little bit earlier and with the testimony, but they were so on point. When, when Jesus indwells us, Christian, when, on that day when you realized you could not rely upon yourself for forgiveness, for redemption, that you were a sinner, that you fall short of the glory of God, when that day when you realized that the wages of your sin is death, it's eternal separation from God, and you turned from relying upon yourself and trusting in your effort, and instead in humble dependence upon Christ, cried out for forgiveness and committed your life to Christ and received him as your Lord and Savior. On that day, the scriptures teach the most amazing thing we are united, or were united with him on that day. We are in him. We are united to him. We have this living, vital union in Christ. And how that manifests itself is he takes up residence in our life through the person of the Holy Spirit. So Jesus, who is fully God and fully human, sends the Holy Spirit, God the Spirit, to live inside of us. We are now filled with God. And we have all of God's resources and all of God's blessings and all of God's power that we need for this life in us right now. We don't need more. We got it. It's there. Now will we appropriate it? In that moment of temptation, when there is something in this world that's attractive to us, when there's a a bottle or a drug or a habit or something that we think, I need that in order to be happy and to be full And in that moment of temptation, we have at our disposal the power to say no to temptation and yes to God's grace because we are filled with his resurrection power. The same power that raised our Lord lives in us today. You've been filled in him. And then one final aspect of why we should be captivated. In the end of verse 10, you've been filled in him who is the head of all rule and authority. We should be captivated with God, with Jesus, if for no other reason that he rules as the sovereign Lord over everything, including our worst enemies, sin, death, Satan. He's sovereign over them all, and he's defeated them. You know, the, the author of the book of Hebrews He starts out in chapter 1, establishing the idea that that Jesus is God. Some of the best verses on the deity of Christ are in Hebrews chapter 1. But in Hebrews chapter 2, he shifts to Jesus' humanity. Again, fully God, fully human at the same time. And as he begins to explain why Jesus needed to be fully human, in verse 14, we read these words. Since therefore... The children, us, share in flesh and blood. He himself, Jesus, likewise partook of the same thing, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. (laughs) Friday, man, did we ever have a wonderful Good Friday service. It was so great joining with our daughter church at New City and we all came together and the praise and worship team was just fun and we sang our hearts out and we were just worshiping God and we heard a great message from Ben and we got to take the Lord's Supper together 
I, I love Good Friday. I'm glad that we have a service that focuses upon that day when Jesus died. So why is it called Good Friday? This verse tells us it's through the death of Jesus that Satan himself was defeated. On that day when Satan thought, I'm victorious, he was actually celebrating the victory of Jesus at that moment. But the weekend doesn't start, or doesn't end with Good Friday. It ends with Easter Sunday. He didn't stay in the grave. And so Paul, when he's writing to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and I highly recommend anybody who has questions about the resurrection, maybe you're wondering, did he, did he really raise from How do you know it's not a myth, a fable? You need to read 1 Corinthians 15, where Paul puts out before us the evidence of why we should believe that Jesus rose from the dead. He goes on and he gives us the theological reasons for why Jesus had to literally rise from the dead. And at the end of that wonderful exposition and explanation comes this passage where he just is in awe of the resurrection of Jesus and how, as the sovereign Lord, he has defeated our worst enemies. And he says, so in light of Jesus' resurrection, as the firstborn from among the dead, you, me, as Christians, how does this impact us? It is the promise and guarantee of our own future resurrection. And he describes that day in this beautiful language in a moment in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, the trumpet will sound on that day when Jesus returns and the dead in Christ will rise first. This corruptible must put on incorruption. This mortal will put on immortality and all of us will sing, O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Are you captivated with Jesus? Are you captivated by Jesus have you been taken captive by Jesus? Or are you still a captive to your sinful nature under the power of an enemy who Jesus has already defeated? If you don't know the right answer to that question, if you can't with full assurance say, I'm a captivated by Jesus, I belong to him, I hope you'll talk to me after the service or to the people who will be in our care area, pastors, will come up to me and we'll have lunch this week and we'll begin to explore the questions you have. Lord Jesus, for the one here this morning who isn't captivated by you yet, I pray for him or her specifically. Would you begin to do a work in their heart? May it start with them being honest with themselves, with them having a willingness to at least investigate what you say about yourself, Lord Jesus. Father, give them a yearning to know more. And for those of us who know you, Lord Jesus, we thank you. We thank you for your death on Good Friday. But even more, we thank you for the resurrection life and power we have because the grave did not hold you down. And so to you, Lord Jesus, we give you all the glory and praise. Amen.